The 1950s gave us some truly marvellous aircraft, and one of my all-time favourites is the Convair Sea Dart. Now if this looks like somebody took a Delta Wing supersonic interceptor, slapped a couple of skis underneath and thought, yeah, she'll be right, then I can't blame you. But to looks can be deceiving. This was actually a well thought out attempt at building an aquatic supersonic interceptor for the US Navy, and if it weren't for a lack of understanding in certain aerodynamic concepts, it could well have gone on to become a full production aircraft. But before we take a deeper look at that, I'd like to take a moment to further explain the production of my new website, which was done with the help of today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your website, business, or brand online. And in a previous video where I talked about Squarespace, I said that I would walk you through how I made my own website in just a single day. So today we're making the homepage. When I first started, I didn't really know what I wanted as the end product, so the variety of different pre-made templates helped a lot. After a quick spell of browsing, I found a template I liked and got to work. Now when you first open up a template, you get prompted by a welcome message and a little tutorial that explains some of the tools that are available to you. Once that was out of the way, I began customising the homepage to better resemble what I have over on YouTube, which was just a simple case of uploading the background image. I then messed around with some of the heading texts, then I added some planned pages to the navigation bar at the top of the screen, which was done with a simple drop down menu, and then I got to work on building a little introduction section. After a moment's hesitation where I couldn't decide if I wanted a button to link to my channel or not, I settled on adding a nice little social links bar at the bottom of the screen to keep things nice and simple. Squarespace has a built-in system that lets you link many social platforms like Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Discord, and even Twitch. It was then a simple case of deciding which font I liked best, and bam, it was done. This only took 15 minutes all in all, and just like that I had a functional home screen from which I could expand and grow the website as I saw fit. Now a homepage is all well and good, but it's pretty useless without other stuff connected to it, so I'll be covering that next time. But if you're looking to build a website for yourself or your business, head over to Squarespace today for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash rexishanger to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video, and now let's take a closer look at the Convair Sea Dart. As far as aircraft designs go, especially seaplanes, this is certainly one of the more extreme examples you'll see. But how does a project like this even begin? Well, to better understand how we got to this militarised jet ski, we need to look back to the immediate years following the end of the Second World War. Before the war, seaplanes and flying boats played a major role in both civil and military aviation. They established the first major transcontinental air routes, and as they didn't rely on using expensive airfields and runways, they were able to operate in very remote locations. This made them a vital tool during the war, particularly the Pacific War. In this theatre, flying boats of the US Navy often formed the aerial vanguard of their island hopping campaigns, performing vital reconnaissance, maritime patrol, and anti-shipping missions. However, as a result of said island hopping campaigns, and the war in general, a vast network of airfields had been built all over the world by war's end. This led many countries and militaries to believe that the need for seaplanes and flying boats was, if not at its end, then certainly reduced. One of the exceptions to this line of thought was the US Navy. In the late 1940s, the Navy embarked on some fairly serious studies around the idea of a mobile naval base. This was partly because of the success of sea drones in the previous war, partly as a way to manage the huge costs of policing the Pacific, and partly to mitigate the potential losses in the event of a nuclear strike. This concept was also influenced by the advent of supersonic aircraft. In the early days, many believed that such aircraft, owing to their weight, would not be able to operate safely from an aircraft carrier. Additionally, many early supersonic jets had high approach speeds for landing, and performed less than ideally at slow speeds, which made the problem for the Navy even worse. To get around this problem, the Navy sought out designs for a water-based interceptor instead. After receiving submissions from several manufacturers, they ended up selecting the proposal by Ernest Stout and his design team at Convair. This began in 1948 as Project Skate, which was a series of extensive studies into jet-powered seaplanes. 
Multiple designs were explored, as high-speed, jet-powered, water-based aircraft was completely new territory, and in fact only one other jet-powered seaplane was currently around, and that was a model made in England by Saunders Row. Eventually, Project Skate evolved into a much larger two-seat aircraft, one that ultimately never left the drawing board, except for a model, but it did lead to another design study, Project Better. Experiences gained from the experimental XF-92 had convinced Stout's design team to switch to a high-performance delta-winged seaplane instead. This project was pursued over the following two years, with Project Better evolving into the Convair Model 2, a blended hull and fuselage design with a wing that strongly resembled that of the F-102, which would eventually fly several years later. The Navy reviewed this alongside several other designs, including ones by Boeing and Lockheed, but they finally settled on Convair's proposal in January of 1951, ordering two prototypes as the XF-2Y-1, which would eventually receive the name of Sea Dart. Like the F-102 that Convair was designing for the Air Force, the Sea Dart would have a delta wing, but unlike the F-102, it would be powered by two engines. This was not the result of some design study, but that of a naval requirement, which required two engines for added safety. As it would spend a considerable amount of time over the ocean, the prospect of a single engine flameout was not pleasant, and although two smaller engines were less efficient and added weight when compared to a single larger unit, they provided much needed redundancy. The power plants selected were a pair of the new Westinghouse XJ46 WE-2, which was expected to provide 6,100 pounds of thrust. But thrust alone wasn't going to get the sea dart into the air. The laws of hydrodynamics had always presented a challenge with seaplane design, resulting in various hull forms and float designs over the years. But as the provision of floats or a deep hull on a proposed supersonic aircraft was both laughable and impossible, the Sea Dart's design featured something radical. For takeoff and landing, the Sea Dart literally used a pair of water skis. These were designed by Stout's hydrodynamic research lab, and they would retract into the fuselage once the Sea Dart was airborne. While great on water, this wasn't particularly useful for beaching operations or taxiing from the hangar to the seaplane ramp, and so the Sea Dart also had a set of small wheels installed on the aft end of the skis, as well as a tailwheel. Early model tests of the XF-2Y were promising. So promising, in fact, that the Navy placed an initial production order. Sources seem to conflict on the exact number, but on the 28th of August 1952, three months before the prototype was even complete, they ordered between 8 and 14 production aircraft, with four being set aside for service testing. Unlike the F-102, these were ordered to come with a fixed armament. Again, sources seem to conflict on the chosen number, but it was expected to be equipped with either two or four of the 20mm Colt Mark 12 cannons. The first prototype was complete by December of 1952. Delays in the development of the Westinghouse J46 engine had led to it being equipped with the lower power J34. This meant a reduction in engine thrust from 6100 pounds to 3400, and as such the performance expectations for its first outings were suitably diminished. This wasn't too much of a problem, as the first prototype's main goal was to test the water handling of the airframe and the skis, with flight performance being a secondary objective. The Sea Dart splashed into its intended element for the first time on the 14th of December 1952. At the controls was Convair's chief test pilot, Ellis Sam Shannon, who took the aircraft out into the San Diego Bay for its first taxiing tests. He was immediately shocked by the roughness of the experience and as the speed was increased, it became rapidly apparent that there were serious issues with both water handling and vibration. Now, if you've ever been on a small boat or a jet ski traveling over the water at relatively high speed, you'll know that the height and frequency of the waves on the water makes a big difference to your level of comfort. If it started to cut up rough, you were in for a rough time. The same thing happened with the sea dart, but it was further compounded by the fact that it was riding along on skis. The constant, sharp impact of the waves at high speed caused them to vibrate, and they also flexed between the struts that mounted them to the fuselage. 
Since the forward strut was mounted directly below the cockpit, the combined effect of both the vibration and this flexing made for appalling conditions for the pilots. The result was an airframe that was literally trying to shake itself apart, and a pilot who suffered from loss of vision as he experienced 5.5 Gs in both positive and negative acceleration 17 times a second. During one of these tests, the vibrations were so violent that the nose probe was actually snapped clean off, and it had to be fared over for the Sea Dart's maiden flight, which took place on the 9th of April 1953. Owing to the horrendous water handling problems, the second prototype was cancelled, and the first prototype was repurposed as a testbed for ski and afterbody modifications. Additionally, the afterburning Westinghouse J45 was now available, and there was little point in completing the second prototype as it was designed for the less powerful J34. Around this time, another test pilot, Charles Richberg, joined the Sea Dart program, and along with Shannon, he spent the rest of 1953 being slowly battered upon the waves of San Diego Bay until the arrival of the next Sea Dart. This was the first of the service test aircraft, the YF-2Y1. It was rolled out in early 1954, featuring the far more powerful J-46 engines and some minor changes on its skis, the most noticeable of which was the removal of the small landing wheels. As it was significantly more powerful, this aircraft was subject to a much wider range of testing. Richberg was now the main test pilot, and after the initial taxiing and low-speed flight trials, he began to explore the high-speed characteristics of the Sea Dart. Unfortunately, by this point, the idea of it being a true supersonic aircraft had fallen through. The prototypes had been designed, built, and flown before the full understanding of area rule was applied to aircraft design. Because of this, the Sea Dart experienced high levels of transonic drag, and this, combined with the modest power of the engines, meant that the estimated top speed dropped from Mark 1.4 to Mark 0.99. Despite this disappointing development, Richberg and the Sea Dart would still make history. On the 3rd of August 1954, he took the Sea Dart into a shallow dive from 34,000 feet, and while it couldn't go supersonic in level flight, it did so on this occasion, marking the first and only time that a seaplane would ever achieve supersonic speeds. Along with the high-speed testing, a lot of work was also done to evaluate the Sea Dart's performance on the open sea. Owing to the added risks, chiefly being the poor seaplane being overwhelmed by a sudden increase in swell, these tests became quite involved, with support, auxiliary, and rescue boats on standby, and at least one helicopter and one chase plane were required for both safety, chase, and photo coverage. Along with testing its handling on the open water, a concept of recovering the sea dart using an LSD vessel was also evaluated. This went pretty smoothly in the calm waters of San Diego Bay, but the aircraft couldn't enter the ship's loading bay under its own power and had to be towed aboard. When this was trialled on the open sea, the combination of wind, swell, and the fact the wings barely cleared a couple of feet each side soon led to this idea being abandoned from fear of losing the plane, the ship, and everyone else. By this point, the Navy was finding it difficult to justify the continued funding of the program as it was. Not only were the performance results of the Sea Dart best described as mixed thus far, but the cost of modifying the aircraft to the area rule, so that they could go supersonic, wasn't going to be cheap. As a result of this, the original order had already been cut back to just five aircraft in March of 1954, and if the Sea Dart's water handling didn't dramatically improve, the whole thing was at risk of cancellation. It was then, with the cruelest sense of timing, that the project was dealt a mortal blow. On the 4th of November, the Navy and Convair organised a bold flight demonstration of the Navy's mobile base concept aircraft. Members of the national press and senior officers from multiple services were invited to witness the XFY-1 vertical takeoff aircraft, also known as the POGO, the turboprop R3Y Tradewind, and of course, the YF-2Y Sea Dart. The demonstrations of the Pogo and the Tradewind went off without a hitch, but during the Sea Darts demonstration, which was meant to be the day's culminating event, disaster struck. During a low altitude pass at about 500 knots, the aircraft entered into a violent pitch oscillation, and Richberg was killed as his aircraft broke up over the bay in a streaking fireball. 
Immediately following this, all Sea Dart operations were temporarily suspended until the Navy could complete a full investigation. The accident was not a result of the defect in the airframe per se, but rather a situation that happened all too frequently in these early high-speed aircraft. Supersonic aircraft had full-powered flight controls, it would be impossible to operate them at speed without it, and the earlier units were often too powerful at times. Richburg had switched on his afterburners, but due to the high placement of the engines, the increase in thrust had caused the nose to pitch down a little. He pulled up to correct this, but used too much force, the nose went up too far, and so he pushed the stick back down, and it only took a few of these movements at 500 knots to compromise the airframe. After the investigation, the Sea Dart was deemed safe, mostly, and operations resumed at the end of December. Owing to concerns about powered control input at high speeds, high-performance tests were still restricted, and so the Sea Dart was reduced to skimming around on the water in various handling trials. A lot of this was done by a third test pilot, Billy J. Long, who had originally stood in to cover Shannon during a short illness, but ended up staying on full-time. This work was initially done with the original XF2Y, featuring an experimental single ski, and in its first iterations it provided such rough conditions that Long had to abandon almost all of his takeoff attempts. The ski was subsequently modified with a new dampening device, which improved things dramatically, in the sense that he didn't feel like a kitten trapped in a washing machine, but his opinion was that a twin ski arrangement offered better stability. This stability arrived in the form of the third sea dart. This was another of the service test aircraft, almost identical to the one that was lost, and Billy Long sometimes flew them both on the same day. Over the next year, they completed a vast array of tests, both on the water and in the air. Often, they were compared together to establish if the single or double ski configuration was better. Each one was modified multiple times to improve handling on the water, which continued to be a bouncy, gyrating, uncomfortable nightmare. One attempt at remedying the problem was to get the aircraft airborne as quickly as possible, and in March 1955, the use of JATO pods proved to be a promising solution. This was first done in the quiet waters of San Diego Bay, but tests on the open sea also showed a dramatic reduction in takeoff run, which meant a dramatic increase in pilot comfort. But despite marked improvements in water handling, and almost perfect handling in the air at low and medium speeds, the high speed tests were never resumed. By this point, the Navy could not justify further expense on the project, and their need for the Sea Dart had completely disappeared. The previous doubts about operating supersonic aircraft from carriers had been misplaced, and the introduction of steam catapults in 1950 meant that far heavier aircraft could now be operated at sea. With no further use for them, and no new funds forthcoming from the Navy, Convair put the prototype and the YF-2Y into storage at the conclusion of their test program, which wrapped up in the middle of 1955. Two other service test aircraft had been built by this point, but after Richburg's fatal crash they had never flown, and these were also put into storage. And because of all this, all the remaining sea darts that were built survive today. They're all in the United States, and have spent time on display at various locations, with the exception of one that was damaged whilst in storage. One is at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, one is at the Wings of Freedom Aviation Museum in Pennsylvania, and one is at the Florida Air Museum. Though it was only operational for half a decade, the Sea Dart racked up a remarkable number of flight hours. It was also flown, or floated I guess, in a variety of different configurations as they tried to figure out all the issues with the water handling. To go into detail on all of that would probably take this to a one or even a two hour video, and a very boring and technical one at that. But if that's something you're interested in, I can recommend a book that was written by the third test pilot, Billy Long. I've provided a link to it down below if anyone was interested in further reading. It covers each aircraft in detail, their test history, and it's crammed with his own comments and observations on the performance of the Sea Dart, both in the water and in the air. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, the people who fund my ever-growing addiction to coffee and aviation books, and a special shout out as well to the Wing Commander tier patrons, and a warm welcome to Psycho Flight, who is the newest addition to this prestigious cohort. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.